So hello, welcome again and good evening. My name is Amy and I am the Public Programs Manager at the New York Transit Museum. If you haven't been to the museum, it's, it's worth the visit. It's very unique. It's located in downtown Brooklyn in a decommissioned IND subway station. We are open now from Thursday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can reserve tickets on our website. We also have a gallery in Grand Central Terminal and a shop. So for today's program, if you would like captions, go to either captions or the three dots at the bottom of your screen and click captions and then click show captions. We are also going to leave time for questions at the end. So feel free to add them to the chat during the presentation and I will share them out at the end. So today we have a panel of individuals who are all involved in art in the subway in some shape or form. And I am very pleased to introduce first off the moderator of our panel and my good friend, Susanna Temkin. Susanna Temkin is curator at El Museo del Barrio and holds a PhD degree from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. At El Museo, she has curated or co-organized co -organized many exhibitions such as Domestic and X, Estamos Bien, La Trien, La Trienno, and the museum's 50th anniversary show, Culture and the People. People. So now I'll hand it over to Susanna. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you to Hillary Goldstein, who's also been really instrumental in bringing tonight's event together. I'm so thrilled to be collaborating with the New York Transit Museum for tonight's event, which we're holding because um, we're now in National Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I just want to echo back, you know, as a good friend and as a colleague, uh, Amy, you've sort of been privately um, in the know about my enthusiasm for art in the subway um, and thinking about what it means to encounter art in this very particular space. Um, of course, the subway is so different from seeing art in a museum, which is the space that I'm usually um, working with art as a curator in at El Museo del Barrio. And I'm so curious, you know, something that I find so fascinating about the subway, particularly as a New Yorker, this is a place where we're all jammed together. We're all in movement. We're all often thinking about different things uh, as we navigate through New York City streets underground. And I'm always thinking about what does it mean for us to encounter um, a mosaic on a platform or a light piece that you can only see when you're transiting underground on an elevated line. How do those experiences um, change our commute and our encounters with these works of art? And so even though I'm always thinking about uh, art in the subway from the perspective of a passenger. What I think is going to be so exciting about today's event is that we're going to be able to talk to two artists who have created work specifically from the subway um, in collaboration with the Arts and Transit program. So I'll introduce um, those speakers in just a minute, but in acknowledging um, Hispanic Heritage Month, I also wanted to acknowledge um, just like the diversity and the fact that there are so many numerous other artists from the Latinx and Latin American diaspora who have contributed to this public collection underground. So I'm just gonna move very quickly through some of these images so that we can get to the main event, um, but pointing out uh, a few different examples of works that I hope you've all encountered or seen before, um, including Liliana Porter's Wonderland-inspired Alice, The Way Out, a really great example about thinking about how coming in and out was um, thought about in terms of this particular piece. Um, Manny Vega's Un Sabado en, en, en la 110, um, a title that should give you an indicator of where it is. It's on 110th Street. And I think also Manny really um, was thinking about that neighborhood of El Barrio when he was making this piece. Um, a work not in mosaic, um, but a piece by uh, Juan Sanchez reaching out for one another. I think touch um, can be a touchy subject when it comes to the subway, but I think Juan really manages to bring in um, a spiritual notion of togetherness in transit. 
And then um, a more recent work, Fidele Baez's is um, kind of fantastical, Si Guapa, si guapa Antellana, Me Llamo Sueño de la Madrugada, who is more sci-fi than us, which draws on the Dominican traditions of Washington Heights to create this tropical sci-fi fantasy underground. So, I mean, that's just a few. And today we're fortunate enough to have Sandra Bloodworth with us who can um, speak to more examples. But for now, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be um, in conversation with uh, Nitsa Tufino and Glendalise Medina, two artists who I've had the pleasure in working um, together with at El Museo del Barrio. And as a plug, um, just as if you haven't been to the, uh, the New York Transit Museum, if you haven't been to El Museo, it's a great time to come. And we are showing a work, a, an exhibition called Something Beautiful in which both Glendalise and Nitsa um, are participants. Um, here you can see Glendalise's uh, site-specific work, Cohoba, to the left of your screen. Um, and in this room, we have um, one of Nitsa Tufino's um, um, Pareja Taina on the wall. Uh, in thinking about tonight's program, I was also really excited about bringing these two artists together as New Yorkers who share Puerto Rican roots and who, for me, also reflect a kind of lineage um, between two different moments in the subway station, having created some of the early as well as the most recent projects alongside um, Sandra, who's director of MTA Art and Design. Um, so without more further ado, I think I want to introduce our panelists. Um, firstly, Nitsa Tufino, who is a renowned New Yorican artist working in ceramic, oil painting, drawing, and printmaking. Her work explores Mexican, Caribbean, and classic roots to champion non-Western historical narratives, and she is committed to art education and public art. Tufino has received numerous awards and is a member of El Consejo Gráfico Nacional, a coalition of Latino printmakers and printmaking workshops. And Nitsa, you don't have this in your official bio, but I have to recognize that you're the only woman founder of Taller Boricua, the Puerto Rican print shop, um, such an important place and um, organization very close to El Museo's heart. Um, after Nitsa, we'll be hearing from Glendalise Medina, an Afro-Caribbean conceptual interdisciplinary visual artist who was born in Puerto Rico and raised in the Bronx. Medina received an MFA from Hunter College, has presented artwork at many notable venues, received several prestigious grants and fellowships, and is currently a professor at SVA's MFA Fine Arts Program. And then joining us um, throughout the program is Sandra Bloodsworth, director of Bloodworth, I'm sorry, um, Director of Metropolitan Transportation Authority Arts and Design, the program responsible for visual and performing arts throughout the transit system. Sandra joined MTA Arts and Design as manager in 1988 and has served as director for 24 years. Um, MTA Art and Design will be publishing a new book on their public collection entitled Contemporary Art Underground next April. And um, I'm going to just give a Oh, I'm sorry, I should have had this screen up so that you could have had the preview, but we will um, be getting into these two projects by Nitsa and Glendalise um, in just a moment. But I added as a little bit of an excerpt, again, um, I've been thinking about the subway and uh, by coincidence, I've been delayed a couple of times this week um, at the 86th Street stop where Nitsa's um, West Side Views is on view. And uh, I was able to make this encounter with a poem by Pedro Pietri. Um, this is just a short excerpt that I think is a great intro to your project, Nitsa. So just a part of the poem, making plaques to make a point, giving useless life to joint. Underground, there is no light, turns a journey into flight. Here upon these walls lies the laughter and the calls. And I know I'm no Pedro Pietri, but I think that's um, just such a great, a great start to hearing about your project. Great. So take it away. Well, um, I'm very happy to be here. I have to thank uh, Amy, Sandra Bloodworth, Susanna Temkin for putting this uh, this PowerPoint together and this lecture. 
and introducing the artists and being next to Glenda, 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 uh, Glenda Lee's. Uh, when I came into, I came to uh, NTA was through through competition when I won the 103rd the train station. And uh, many people compete. I always ask all the artists, you, got, you have to compete, you have to compete and uh, uh, you have to come up with, with ideas and stuff like that. And uh, and then if, if you get the commission, it's by excellence of your work. And uh, you know, if you could also do fabrication, if you don't fabricate, then you can design. And then you will work for Arts for Transit to, to complete it. And it'll take a couple of years and you get through the hurdles. You know, there's a lot of things you got to work on, installation, uh, insurances, you know, the union, there's a lot of stuff. But it's a lot of fun doing the, the artwork. When I did the 103rd that I got it, I was so excited because it's in El Barrio. Um, I'm from El Barrio. A lot of my family is from El Barrio. Uh, we're Puerto Rican and Mexican also. And I always thought of the train station as a cave. And the cave doesn't have light, doesn't have anything. And you want I wanted to really uh, do this gray motifs from the Indians of Puerto Rico that had uh, Taino motifs. And I wanted to work with the, how would I say, the, the mountains, the flowers, the fruits and all of that. And, that's, and the water, different semis. So I did uh, travel to Puerto Rico and went to a couple of places in Aguabo, uh, Puerto Rico, where there were some designs that the, the Indians had done. And then the uh, Castro Blanco and Pisionary, who were the architects uh, from the train station, they, they loved the idea. I also discussed it with the community planning board because you have to engage people this is different from doing a piece that you do for your home or for a gallery or something like that. It's public art because it's for the public. And you want it to be uh, accepted. When I did the 86th Street, I was simply invited with Wendy. Wendy invited me to a big meeting at the community planning board uh, because uh, they had a couple of ideas of what they wanted to do with uh, the 8060 subway station. And uh, it, it, it was because of the, uh, the, the way that they got the money for, for, to do the station. Um, so it had to go for youth. So I gave them a lot of ideas of things that it, they were possible to do, you know, the hurdle I've done. And then they asked me if I wanted to, to, to work on it with Grofner House and the community planning board. And I said, yes, I will put the program together. And we did it, and it took us three years, and it's still there. I don't know; it's been it's been already twenty five years or thirty years that's been up. And part of it was also it was challenging. Uh, but an artist always, you know, likes challenges. Not only uh, uh, in in technical things about doing the work, but also working with people that makes it challenging, and and then you can make it happen. So I worked with youth that they were from 17 to 24 who had dropped out of school and it was to give them an incentive to come and work in these pieces and they got paid. And then also we had counseling for them. Uh, we made, them, made sure some of them went back to college after they finished, they got their GED. And it was very successful and we worked a lot with the community and it was this community was from 110 to 59th street to central park west to the riverside drive so we we taught them i taught them uh in the group of, of these young people that you have to study the community and study people and study study the seniors go to the to the schools you know uh stores talk to people go to meetings you know engage people, engage people in the community so that that's how we came out with the different scenes that you see at the train station on 86th Street. And then actually the studio was housed at Grosvenor House in 105th Street. Uh, I think it was Amsterdam. And uh, the, the rest is history it was done, you know? And these young people now, they're, they're married, they have children, they live in other states. Uh, and it was a great incentive. So it, it is possible to do projects like this. 
uh, with young people to change their lives. That was the uh, the challenge, to change their life and to gear them to learn about community life and about themselves and to change their life for a positive uh, for the future. And um, we're going to have um, room for, for questions too, but Sandra, I also want to invite you into this conversation. One thing that um, I think that we is really special about this project, Nitsa, is precisely what you were talking about. Um, this, you know, we're talking about this as your project, but you really had a lot of collaborators, um, these kids, Pedro Pietri, all of whom are um, captured on these plaques that, uh, that Pedro Pietri referenced in the poem that I started our conversation with. Well, I, ha I had the technical, you know, and the technical on how to do this and how to work in ceramics, how to do the tiles. I had a, a lot of that. I had a wonderful, Sopol was his name, who worked on the installation. So that's another person. Other people came into the project to, to, to work with, you know, and to resolve problems. Also, this station was so fantastic about it is that MTA decided to remove all the commercial space in the station and just do just the plaques which is all about, about community life in the West Side. So here you have a family, you have the Asian family, uh, uh, how would I say, uh, the, the grandmother, the mother, and the child. And then you have the 96th Street subway station and each plaque was through photograph, photographing the whole neighborhood and then drawing some of those photographs in the drawing and then carving them out in linoleum and then doing the, the tiles in porcelain this is why white clay and then glazing and all of that so it took us three years to do this and they learned the whole technique and actually each each student each person who is now an artist uh, did the, the I, I geared them to work from from the first stage which is the photograph drawing cutting it out and stuff like that and glazing and and, and firing and all of that and then uh, put in a wonder board, uh, special cement and wonder board so that it could be installed in the station. They learned the whole technique and at the same time they got their GED and then after that they made applications so they could go into college. So very positive, very positive. And what I was trying to gear when they were doing the pieces is that each one had to be a little bit different and show a little bit of the creative spark of the person that is different from the from the other one. So each one has a little bit of a difference creatively in in, in of and inside of the person that did it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so these are all the different plaques. There, I don't know how many plaques we did, and then we made some extra ones mm -hmm. so that in case something happened, they could be put back. And what's so great about this station is that. Brandeis High School is near there because it's on Columbus or Amsterdam. And we never had any graffiti or, you know, it's, it's really fantastic how this project they take and people love it and young people love it. They respect it. And it's been there for, for so, so many, many years. I'm so happy. Yeah, and uh, I think, again, I want to make sure, Sandra, if you have, I know this project is uh, um, particular for you. Yeah, I, this is a very special project for me, and, and I must say a very special artist. Um, this was the first project. I, I joined Arts Arts for Transit at the time, uh, now MTA Arts and Design, in 1988. And Lydia, and I'm sorry, Anitza was working on this project. It was already well underway, and we were approaching the installation. Um, and so a I guess a couple years later, the we the installation was done and went around 89-90. And the experience with Nitsa, her relationship with the students that were uh, at risk youth and her involvement, it did not stop with the technical. She she said, I want to talk about the technical. It began <laughs> with the technical. But Nitsa, she approached this as I'm sure she does everything with all her heart. And she became 
everything to this project and, and so many things to these youth that you see. And she became involved in their lives. And, and I'm sure many of these lives were changed because of this involvement of Nietzsche. But she, she did one of those wonderful things uh, that was to really focus on the place and to focus on, in doing so, she focused on the people who use this place. And out of it came this project that Nietzsche, I, I, I hate to tell you, it's 34 years it's been up, 34. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it. you have made your mark. You made your mark there and you made your mark on me on oh, how yeah. I would go forward and, and what I would want projects to do and be and the heart of them and that we would always have that heart in everything we did by always remembering who we were creating this work for. So I thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Sandra, very much. This this is what we always got to have in mind. MTA is everything is for the community. It's for the people that people that travel through the train station. They go in and out. They go to work. Some of them are sick. Some of them are not sick. They're going to go see their mother. You know, uh, people die. They're traveling in the train. You know, I mean, it's is this is where we connect with everybody, you know, and, and this is community. It's like the community traveling through the, you know, in in in, in under underground. We're on top of the ground and we're underground. Yeah. So it's very important. And then as an artist, if you want to work on something, you always got to put your your full self heart into it. And to me, it was not only important. The work, the exquisiteness of, of, of the work that have to be put up on, on the train station, it was that I have to have an effect, and uh, 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 how would I say, uh, an effect, a uh, situation with the with the with the young artists, so that they could do great work. That's that you do it. They, you know, I use brushes and paints and all of that. They were the brushes and paints, but I have to work on them, on their psychic, on themselves, and then the whole point for for them to change, but the work. It shows here, you know, uh, the sensibility and, and, and the grayness. And it's for the community. It's for the community in the West Side. Well, Nitsa, I'm I'm part of that community. Like I said, I live on the West Side. I'm passing through this station all the time. The other station that I'm also passing through all the time, which you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, um, I'm going to kind of talk us through this quickly. Um, as a transition, but that is your near Borinquen um, mosaic murals at the 103rd Street station. And the reason that I see it so often is because as we see um, in these images, this is uh, the closest station to El Museo del Barrio. So when you all come visit, this is the station that you will be passing through. Um, so please keep your eye out for Nietzsche's work. I'm kind of moving through these images quickly because I know we're going to come back to the ideas that lay behind them that Nitsa you talked about already but how you were pulling from um, ideas about Taino or uh, the ancient indigenous peoples in Puerto Rico when you were coming up with these forms and for me that's the real um, what I see as a really interesting connection between you and Glendalise Medina, who um, also works with some of these ideas. So Glendalise, I'm gonna hand it off to you to introduce us to your um, subway commission. And then we'll all come together to be able to talk about these. And in the meantime, um, those of you in the audience, I hope you're you know, thinking about questions because we'll have time to uh, engage with you all directly as well. So Glendalise. Hi. Hi. I just want to thank everybody in the audience and for the hosts and Susanna and for Nitsa. Um, and thank you guys for your attention. So I just want to talk a little bit about my practice before I talk about the station. And so my practice really focuses on pattern recognition. How do we, as humans, um, create structure? How do we ingest information and make sense of the world? So my visual language comes from this piece called Boombox. And what I did is I stripped the boombox of these basic uh, shapes. Next slide. And I put it in a profile orientation because I consider it a self-portrait. 
And I stripped it of all this detail and I just put in 50 basic shapes and this became my matrix. And then I took this matrix and I mirrored it on top of each other at different degrees. Next slide. So this is black diamond. So this is at 45. Next slide. And this is at uh, 180 with the center shapes dropped out. And what I'm really trying to do here is I'm really trying to accentuate like Gestalt principles of closure and other Gestalt principles because I'm really interested in how we ingest information in visual language. Next slide. And this is black square. So I have these four compositions. These four compositions create my visual language. And so let's fast forward to 2020. <laughs> Next slide. 2020. Um, like most of us, I was depressed. It was locked down. I didn't know what I was going to do. I stopped making work. And so I decided to give myself an exercise. Next slide. And I asked my mom, can I borrow a dog? And we go on these 15 minute walks and I would go outside and I would try to be grateful for something, be grateful to be able to walk, be grateful to uh, see, to, to be outside, to be with this dog. It's spring and there's flowers coming up. And I decided I was going to make these three three compositions to show the fluctuation of mood. Next slide. I was going to make these three compositions to show the fluctuation of mood during that time, but also to show like these beautiful experiences that I was having at the moment of this dark kind of experience too. Um, and that really became the proposal that uh, the MTA took, which is called Gratitude's Off Grand. Next slide. And so what I did is I went around Bushwick <laughs> and I went to locations and I would just sit there and I would look at it and I would go to churches, I would go to parks, I would go to locations, there were cultural institutions that were gonna be there for a long time. Um, and then, next slide. So this is, I think, Saint, I took a note, this is Saint, I'm sorry, I took notes, but I wasn't flipping. St. John's, um, I think it's on Puerto Rican Ave. Next slide. Uh, this is a park, yeah, Sternberg Park. And what I'm really interested, so you see Gestalt principles happening right here. If you can see my mouse, this is, this is a Gestalt principle called closure. So if you go to the station, what you're gonna see is like the background is really matte and the colors really come out and pop out because of the background being being matte. And the background is actually not black. The background is like brown, greens, and purples mixed together. Next slide. This is La Marqueta. I think it's Moore Street Market, which has been there for a while. Next slide. And so on the southbound side, instead of going to locations, I thought about the migration of the neighborhood from the Lenape people to the people of the Caribbean. So when you go from left to right, you go Lenape, next slide. A West African from the slave trade, then you go Irish, then you go Italian, then you go all of the Caribbean, next slide. Which incorporates Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, uh, Cubans, Haitians. Um, and those two, like two sides of the platform, I really like what I wanted to uh, like give gratitude in two different ways. Like, how do I think about the future and how do I think about the past and the moment at the same time? So if you want to see the station, next slide. <laughs> it's at Grand Street, off the, book, uh, uh, off the L train um, in Bookstrick. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Gondolais. I think um, we have been meeting internally for the past few weeks and speaking so much, and we were concerned we would uh, be well over time, but I'm happy to report we're all <laughs> <laughs> wonderful because we'll have time, I think, for a more robust um, conversation amongst the three of us and also amongst you at home. So again, um, I, I think we'll maybe take a few minutes to talk, speak among ourselves, but please be preparing questions um, along the way. I, I think I wanna start with a question for you both. Um, it was interesting to me, Glendalise, how you talked about, you're someone who's always ingesting visual language. Um, and I think 
precisely in the space of a subway where we're kind of bombarded all the time with a lot of sights and sounds and smells. Nietzsche, you talked about um, the ads that we see in the subway. I thought that was really interesting that you brought that up um, as being, you know, something that is part of your practice, but that had a particular uh, resonance for you when you were making this work. So I don't know if you can speak a little bit more about how you kind of process that and how you brought it into um, Gratitudes Off Brand. Well, you know, I was thinking about the fluctuation on the train when I was thinking about the, I thought this was a great proposal for the MTA. Not only because I got to go around the neighborhood and just a neighborhood, just by color and like experience, because I would follow people around um, or follow like when people would get out the train, like where people would go. Uh, but I wanted people to feel like you could enjoy this even if you were on the station and didn't get off. Like you could you could enjoy it from, from the train itself. Uh, and you didn't have to get off at that station and still feel movement and still feel fluctuation. So I thought about that. And I, I thought about like tactility. You know, the one thing I love about mosaics is, or, or public art is that you can touch it. Um, so I thought about that, like how pieces would be cut with the centerpieces, because the centerpieces are actually not cut very, they're not cut at all. I wanted them to all be like full shapes um, but that was not really possible at a certain scale. So I was also thinking about that, like materiality, um, how are people going to touch it intimately or engage with it intimately by touch or how are people going to see it from really far away? Um, how can I create movement? How can I direct people up the stairs? You know, all these kind of things which just are really like landscape architectural kind of ideas, um, which I think is necessary when you think about public art, how people move through space. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I think that's, uh, that is, Glenda Lee's a very important point. I think that that is one of the things that we saw in your proposal and in your work, the, the selection panel, is that it the concepts were there, but the concepts were always all very integrated into the architecture, into the place. And so out of the different things that you were doing came a whole, a whole that came together. Um, I, I did want to elaborate, uh, Susanna, if you don't mind, I wanted to elaborate a little bit on something you said up front, which I had sort of pulled out to really ask you to elaborate a little bit on. Um, you know, when you talk about how your practice is inspired by hu how humans learn and and you said it exactly again today that you create order from chaos and you make sense of the world. Now, <laughs> the thing that always hit me about that statement about your practice is how that lined up with the pandemic and the chaos that we all experienced. And out of it came this proposal. I think I was so touched when I first read it of uh, not experiencing I usually am experiencing it with the the position of thinking about how people will experience something someone's proposing with your proposal I experienced it as an individual that had been part of this this world experience this world chaos and here you were speaking to me as well as to the public. And, and I just thought maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that because I think it goes to the heart of this piece. Well, I, you know, I've proposed a lot to the MTA. <laughs> I've proposed a lot to the MTA and this is the first proposal where I felt like, how do I say this? Like, like I felt really good about it because I felt like, oh, everybody could understand this because everybody's going through this in this moment. Um, so it wasn't just about that neighborhood. It was about this moment in time that was happening to all of us and that everybody was actually probably seeking out gratitude in that moment in their own neighborhood, you know, and trying to be positive when we didn't know what was going on. So I think because of that, the public really became really massive to me and it really put the, put people in my practice because sometimes my practice is quite, <laughs> 
singular, <laughs> um, except when I engage other people with fabricators and things like that. But it was the first time that I thought about the public in a very mass kind of way, meaning like, oh, everybody could connect to this. It's not just this neighborhood, like this kind of action is happening all over the world. Um, I mean, in Italy, people were like singing to each other. I mean, we were like singing to each other to entertain ourselves, you know? There was a really beautiful moment, as tragic as it was too. Yeah, you know, Mary Miss said, I heard this early on in my career, that, you know, public art maybe at best are really powerful when you create this, and in her practice, you create this intimate moment in this very public place. And I've carried that with me all these years, but I really felt it's what you're saying right now, Gwendolyn. Yeah. Here in this very public place, we all can connect to this one very intimate mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say the same thing with the 86th Street subway station. When you go in, though, that I mean, the 86th Street over time downtown is so long. It's the architecture also, and it's so close. The train is so close, so that when you're coming in the train and you're sitting down, you can still see the plaques. And when you go outside, you might see one, and you get close to it, and it's like candy. You want to touch it. Uh, because of the color, the colors, you know, the, the, the reds and the blues. And, uh, and and it makes you connect, you know, oh, this is my community, you know, and uh, this, this is a senior or this is a store or, you know, this is the Piraguero, you know, and, uh, and, and, and it talks to everybody and it talks to all the different nationalities that live in the West Side. And that's why it's called the West Side Views, the, the West Side Community. And uh, it, it's important for us to connect in that sense. Also the poem, when you read the poem, and uh, also when you look at the plaque and you see the different people that worked on, on the project also, um, that is very different in, in ceramics is done uh, in, uh, like pencil, like pencil, pencil drawings. Uh, it connects you with the whole place, you know. Uh, the 130 is a little bit different. Is uh, the the architecture there and going down, and how close you are in the in the, in the where the train passes and all of that. Uh, when we put the Museo del Barrio name, so that people know that they were going to El, to El Barrio, and uh, doing all the things with the colors, you know, uh, the neo came, you know the the lakes, the beautiful flowers, uh, the fruit, yuca leaves and stuff like that will also connect the people from the barrio, but eventually it transcends to other communities uh, from, from, from the Caribbean, from Mexico, from El Salvador, from Venezuela, it also translates. So when you do something for public, are you always like looking into that? How can you connect to the community and bring it in you know, so I am 100% with Glenda Lee's, with all that she's saying for the Grand Station, which is magnificent also. Well, I wanted to, I don't want to give us too much whiplash moving back and forth from the PowerPoint, but I will be um, going back a bit to get back to Neo Boding again. But I just, I loved, um, I think we've been talking about the architecture a little bit and I just, I couldn't help, but like, I found like such delight <laughs> in seeing like the circle repetition this diagonal line of the um, handle that, you know, is following you as you go up the stair. And I think mm -hmm. um, there's such subtle details. And then Nitsa, as we, as I try and move us backwards, you talked about the subway in terms of a cave, which I thought um, is so interesting, especially where your pieces are situated up above as you're going down or rising yeah. up. So, I wanted to ask both of you um, a little bit about how you were thinking about the architecture of the subway, like thinking about site specificity. Um, the work we did together at El Museo right now, Glendalise, is extremely site specific within another kind of cave-like space, actually. <laughs> um, and and Sandra, I'm sure you can give us all of the interesting um challenges of working with subway architecture that you've faced over the years with artists. Um, so whoever wants to jump in on that question. Well, I mean, from the 103rd, 
when I, I got the commission, they, pro they were going to close the station because that's question, that station is in a hill. You know what I mean? And he sees a lot of water, a lot of water. And they were going to close it down. And the community board and El Museo, who Jack Aguero's was the director, he fought like he fought a lot not for them to close it because then people have to go to 110 or 96th Street to to really get, you know, they needed that station there. So, you know, so when when I got the commission, I started working with the about the drawings. What, what am I going to do and stuff like that? I thought of the same thing. It receives a lot of water. It's a cave, you know, uh, let's go back to the pre-Columbian. I'm gonna do it in ceramics, you know. Uh, and and then I use, these are, these are in Nahuatl. These drawings were done actually in stone by the Indians. So in these places like that. So I was thinking of the same thing, you know what I mean? Uh, in 103rd, I was thinking, oh, you know, here, you know, stone, ceramics, water, you know, all of those things that will connect the people also when they went inside the cave, you know, and the light and all of that, you know. So I was thinking about that too um, when I did it in the 80s. That was a long time ago too. <laughs> you know, the, the the architecture, the integration of, of say, Nietzsche's work, but uh, Glenn, Glenn Delis's work is really goes to the design part of arts and design. Um, our program has been involved from the beginning, uh, thanks to Rone Mitchell and Wendy Foyer, with design issues. And it has been our goal over the years. And I'm so I'm proud to see uh, Glenda Lee speaking of that and the and unprompted uh, about those design elements and how important that is. Uh, because it it is you can't you can't bring public art you can't bring art into our environment without being mindful of the environment of the place and of the place is about the people who use the place but it's also about the the physical build out of the place and so the details the work when the when the artist is mindful of that and the artist is working often in tandem with the architects. Um, or through our team, who is very involved with the design aspect of the stations, and the elements come together, you can the, it becomes greater, as they say, than the parts. It becomes a really holistic approach to the work. Um, and I, I would encourage artists, just as Glenda Lease just encouraged artists, uh, I don't know if you caught that, but she said it wasn't the first proposal. Uh, no. That, uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's a little bit of an understatement, but it does go to the integrity of our process. And very often, it's not the first time that an artist, it wasn't the first time they proposed, but not the first time that we really saw when an artist clicked with a site. And and I think Glenda Lee's really brought it to my attention tonight that the artist also knows when it really clicks. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the panel, you know, our panels are, our selection panels are looking for that when it really connects. And if it connects, then they know it's going to connect for the people. Um, so thank you for throwing that in there, Glenda Lisa, and letting us really mm -hmm. speak to what a fair opportunity it is and, and how well that process works. Yeah, I also learned a lot through the process, like through applying, like a lot about my own practice, a lot about how to integrate the public, a lot about how to propose, just a lot of the different things. So it was all helpful, obviously. Right, that's great to hear. And Glendalise, I don't know if you were oh. um, connecting, actually, I mean, I, I may shift us just for a moment away from the subway. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about Cahoba at El Museo, since we're looking at um, this image of Nietzsche with some of the petroglyphs, if you wanted to mention, since again, site specificity about Cahoba bringing us back to. Um, well, Cahoba. you know, when I walked, first of all, go see the show. You have like three more months or four more months or something like that. Um, 
it's funny, you know, because I never thought of myself as somebody who thought about architecture until the past couple of years. And that, that's not true. That's a lie. I never thought that I would integrate architecture into my practice as much as I do right now. Um, and I think that was a big uh, jumping point for me where I started to think about my work living in space, which I never really thought of it as living in space before in, in this kind of way where you interact with it in kind of a... Um, installation kind of way so walking into this cave which became a cave at least in my eyes or in Susanna's eyes who suggested it and thinking about what happens in caves how it relates to Taino culture to ritual to this initiation of a ritual to interacting to touching to interacting with public art by touching it by by engaging with it in a way that you know when I was a kid public art is important to me because that's the way that I engaged with art as a child it was publicly it wasn't in institutions so this act of touching and touching an art object that has the awe of the artist um is a it's like a really fascinating thing for me and integrating into an arc into architectural space is kind of like even more activating it because you, now you're transporting this person into a different space, into an artic, ar architectural space and um, creating a memory. And since humans, spatial memory is like way better than rote memory. Now you're creating a moment in time as like a full body experience, you know? It's like you're seeing it, you're touching it, and then you're changing the environment visually. So it's just like really, trans it can be really transformative other than just like sitting there and just looking at something, you know? but touching something and interacting with it and changing the space to make it look some a different way. It's like, you know, you're creating the set for something to happen, for an experience to happen. Yeah. That was long-winded. I'm sorry. I'm going to be quiet oh, now. No, I, I, thank you. And I um, I do want to say, uh, I realize we've been talking about, um, unfortunately, we've been talking about the pandemic in that particular moment, but I am still one of these people who is still lost in the years. So I just want to make, a correction that this, as Glendalise, as you were saying, the show is still up. It's up through next year, March 10th, yes. <laughs> 2024. We're currently in 2023. So please um, come see Cahoba where you can um, touch and walk through Cahoba by Glendalise Medina and then experience um, Nietzsche wait, wait, wait. painting. You could, touch, you could touch the doorknobs. Door <laughs> just, to, just, to just to be clear what like you can touch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, thankfully, we will have um wonderful guards who will make sure <laughs> that the right things get touched, unlike in the subway. Um, I want to ask one more question, and then um, I want to make sure that anyone in the audience gets the chance to ask things. Um, Amy will be um letting us know because I can't see the chat. But again, I I started um today talking about Pedro Pietri thinking about poetry, you know, I'm interested, as I said, in art in the subway, not just on the walls, but performative actions. So something that we've kind of been dancing around, but the idea of um, the rhythm and the pacing in your work. Um, Nitsa, you keep talking about the long, long architectural wall. Um, yeah. And for me, it's not my stop, even though I keep saying I've been going through it all the time, but it's those black uh, frames of these plaques that like they flash across your eyes as the train is moving. Um, and Glendalise, you also, I think have a perform, I mean, you have a performance practice as well. So um, if either of you wants to mention anything about how rhythm um, was inflected in this, in either of these practices or either of these projects. I'm just curious about that. I'm curious about Pedro Pietri's involvement, like what it was like doing these mosaics with him. Well, in, in, in for the poet, you know, I invited uh, Pedro to take all the uh, students and to work on a poem. And we used to walk the street Broadway, we used to Riverside Drive, we walked with the same thing, you know, and then they started writing and saying things, you know, uh, and they will record it and they will go back to it. So all of the whole point, it has to make, uh, it is about the West Side, you know, and it does have this one, making plots to make a point, giving life to useless joint underground, it is no life. 
eternal journey into flight. Here upon this wall lies the laughter and the call. You know, so then, you know, they got into uh, rap and all of that. And it was wonderful. And then uh, we did it in, in these tiles in seal screen, you know, glazing seal screen, all of that uh, for both sides of the station. And uh, it's it, it sort of like it went with the whole story of the West Side, you know. So it was kind of exciting, you know, when we did that. And then me naming the 103rd Neo Borinquen is the new Borinquen because most of our Puerto Ricans and Dominicans were from the Caribbean. They're there, and the Taino Indians were from Cuba, from the uh, the Antilles, the lesser Antilles, the bigger Antilles. So it's it's all of that. And then walking down there, and then going uh, in the train when you're sitting in the train and you're going really flat, you see that pop, 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 you know, it's, 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 it, it has that rhythm, it has that light, it's the movement, all of that. It's like unraveling a story. Mm. Yeah. You can see words, you can see people, and then you could touch, you know, the texture of the ceramic pieces. Yeah. Amy, do we have any um, questions? Well, I have a bunch of questions. We do have one question in the chat from Lee Sessions, who I'm pretty sure they're the co-curator of the El Museo work. Yes. And it's actually something I was thinking about as well, especially since Nietzsche's work, you're, it's it's been there for decades. Uh, and Lee mentioned wanting to hear more about the experience of the afterlives of their work especially since they're so deeply rooted in the community and how has the presence of the artwork changed your own experiences of the space now and how has it changed your experience of the neighborhood? And I think Nietzsche, that would be fair to say now and then, like maybe how has it changed over time? Well, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, 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 it's really strange because when I first did it uh, and it went up, it, I was there and, and you know, and this big thing was one, one time we had to change one of the pieces to another wall because of the water and all of that and the different things. But um, it's usually people, when I go down to the station and I see people, you know, looking at it or they, you know, if they know who I am, they ask me questions, you know, and I tell them, you know, where, where did I, I see the pieces and all of that. Um, it makes it, it makes it really, really exciting, you know? I mean, uh, and that it has survived that long, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and that it's still there. Uh, it, it's, it's really in, incredible, you know? Um, you know, I, I, I feel good about myself because uh, when I work at it and I, and I uh, work with the clay and the glazes and all, I, I, got, I gotta make it that is good so that it lasts, you know? And I'm sure that pre-Columbian Indians were the same way where they, when they work on their stone and they work on clay, you know? Uh, and clay is, is, is dirt, you know? We die, we go back to, to earth, you know what I'm saying? So all of those things, even the tiles that you see there, they're created from, from earth. And it's fire, it's the elements, fire, water, all of these things. So you have spiritually to be close to all of these things, you know, and to be close to the people in El Barrio. I've been there forever, you know, since my family, you know, they, they came here, you know, I go back and forth. I to Puerto Rico and back. I go to Mexico. Uh, you know, my mother was Mexican. So, you know, I have a big connection with the, the shamans in, in, in Mexico, in Oaxaca. And in Guatemala, I travel a lot to Guatemala, to Antigua, to see the Indians over there. I go, I, I like all of that. And I like El Barrio, that it has all this mix of La Marqueta. And now people selling different things, you know, like it's, 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 it's culture, you know. Uh, we're very much connected one with each other, with earth and fire and spiritually, you know. So an MTA, you know, taking the train every day when you go to work going out coming back again you know it's, it's this is us you know and and, and it's there 
and, and it's going to continue. More stuff is going to come. More things are going to get done. And more artists have to pay attention to these things. And then also, artists, you know, you do your work, you become very good at it. Give a little time to the young people when there are special projects. Don't be too selfish. That is not actually your work, but it is your work to work with the population. It's important that we put something back into society uh, as, as community, as part of this community, especially when young people really do need uh, mentors and they need people to, to they can listen to and that we can, we can you know, help them change their life. They change their life, but you also change yours because I changed mine too. And, and Glendalise, has your work changed your experience of, of the neighborhoods you walked through at all during the pandemic, seeing it in a mosaic? Yeah, it's kind of like it, um, it's funny because the work itself is supposed to memorialize a moment in time, but now it's like really a memorial, you know? because it's permanent and it's there and it's not fleeting. And so, yeah, it's, it, it became more of a memorial in, the, in that moment when it became a public artwork because the drawings were, were kind of like my snapshots of a moment, um, but this is kind of a, a memorial for the time. Mm. Yeah, I think one thing that it's so interesting about both of these works side by side and talking about them and just the the MTA art and designs collection in general is how diverse it is and the fact that you're both responding to or you, the, the children Anitza and Glendalee are, are you're responding to these neighborhoods with the visual vocabulary is so different and, and that's one thing I love about the subway is just how different every artwork is. Uh, and one question I had, and, and if you have questions, we have time maybe for one or two more, you could put them in the chat. But one thing I love also about artwork in the subway is this the fabrication process and how things are, are translated into materials that need to be resilient and stand the test of time. And you're both talking about that permanence. And I think Glendalee's especially, I'm curious if what that process was like for you. I'm pretty sure you didn't work in mosaic before, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I have dabbled in ceramics, but no, I did not fabricate this. It was it was difficult because it was the pandemic and there was like material sources that were like depleting and we had to buy certain colors at a certain time or, and then certain colors were not available. So there were things that were happening like that because of the timing. Um, Please, why don't, why don't you talk about your fabricator and the collaboration a little oh, bit? Oh, yes. Uh, Steven, Mo Steven Mioto mosaics and he's in tandem oh. and he has a fabrication house in Italy and I would go up to upstate New York and pick my tiles um, and then they would give me samples they would they send me a sample but they would give me images and I should have put probably put that in my presentation but I did not and I would check off on the design but everything was remote for the most part except for one time I went up to Camden uh, to pick my tile colors, but it wasn't as hands-on as Nitsa, uh, not just because of the timing, because of the, uh, the time it was, uh, but because also it's just like, that's not the way that I, I work specifically. And I didn't have the skill set. Like, I don't, I don't do mosaics. <laughs> you know, so the, the, the thing with this, like, you know, I, I, I love this guy, this new auto guy, he's fantastic. The thing with me is that, uh, I come from a family of artists and I went to school in Mexico. I went to San Carlos. That's the same school that Siqueiros, Diego, everybody went to it. And the school uh, is very strict on, on, on the fine arts. When you want to study, I study printmaking, I study ceramics, and uh, I studied, studied how to work with clay and how to prepare clay from nothing. If you pick it out in the dirt, in the street, you know what I mean? In the mountain, yeah. what you do with it, you know? So I had a lot of training in that and also working in glazing and all of that. And so I, I love doing my own fabrication. And also I have created, because I'm a printmaker, uh, instead of me doing, uh, how would I say, uh, I do my big drawings and I, 
I carved them out on linoleum and I worked with a slap machine. And that's how, how I get it done. So by the time I got to do the 86 tree, I had done a lot of how would I, experimentation and I had it like sort of down pat in what I was doing, you know what I'm saying? So that was why I was able to take this youth and was able to do that. And most of my commissions, when I do that, I do that and I do all, all kinds of um, thing, but that's because that's, that I was trained to be a painter, I was trained to be a printmaker, ceramist, you know, uh, very strict, very strict. And also every time something comes up that I, I, I go and I learn it. I learn it, you know? Yeah. I mean, why yeah. not? You never know how it's gonna change your life and your artwork and you're gonna mm -hmm. use it, you know what I mean? So that, uh, that's what I tell other artists to do. You know what I'm saying? You know, study it, you know, uh, do it. Um, practice it and all of that. And like Sandra Thierry is fantastic. They have these great people that are that are fabricators that are amazing and they work with artists too, you know what I mean? So sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know what I'm saying? No. You don't have to go and make paper. You just buy the paper already made and do the work. You know? <laughs> so that's so what I, you see, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't make a mold. I won't, make a mosaic, I'm older. I won't make paper. I'm older. <laughs> I won't make paper. No, yeah, because I'm, my, older. I'm older than you, so you're younger. So now you have a lot. Of, now is you know you know you know you're going up like in a cloud. You know you're gonna go up really high. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wow. So well, you know, I mean, and me, let's all knock on let's all knock on wood. So I'm still <laughs> doing. I'm still wood. learning. So I it's fantastic. Two, two um, very exciting stages of both of your careers. And like I said, I feel so blessed um, to have been able to work with you. And again, I want to acknowledge Lee Sessions, who is attending and who's co-curator of Something Beautiful, um, and to come see it. I have one question that I actually, um, I want to ask you, Sandra. And it's a way that I think I can bring in um, a question we received from Arlene Davila. And it goes back to the intro which is, um, you know, the difference between working in a museum, working in a gallery, and your role um, at MTA Arts and Design and assembling um, this public collection, um, which in a sense is a museum that has a very different character um, than, you know, even uh, as diverse a place as El Museo, um, it's still, it's still a, an institutional edifice. So I would love to just hear a little bit, you know, in these closing moments about your visions for the future, um, since, you know, we're convening under um, Hispanic Heritage Month, maybe you can talk about the diversity of the collection. And, you know, um, I don't know if you can preview any projects, but anything that you're thinking about as you continue to um, do all the wonderful new work as we see all the subway construction happening around us, so. Yeah, um, you know, we've talked about it being a diverse collection and I have to say that's really an understatement because the collection is 68% women and BIPOC, 68%. It's really an amazing fact. I think, you know, that in a sense, it's not amazing at all though. What we did, our goal was to go out and to be inclusive. And that if we had an open process that was inclusive, and if we were mindful, if we went to a community and we're selecting art in a community, that we are mindful of this community and the community comes in as part of that selection, but it's always about the best work. And so we have a very diverse, diverse collection, but a collection that is on par with just about any museum collection of any public nature that, that I've experienced. The, the work is there, the opportunity's there. Um, I did see a question that I really want to speak to that, that Arlene asked. Um, you know, she wanted to talk about the process. She wanted, uh, uh, Glenda Lee, I think, answered her question to some degree um, without us asking it, she wanted to talk about the process and how could this be 
easier or more more accessible for artists to to apply. And I feel very strongly. I came to this job in 1988 as an artist. I meant to be there a year or two and continue uh, my own career as a painter. And I was absolutely determined that that process, that anything I had to do with it, it would be fair to artists. It would be about the best art for a place and it would be fair. And so I do, and it would be, it would be a simple process. I do think Arlene, the process is about as simple as you can get as far as applying. Where the difficulty comes in and, and Glenda Lease might want to expand on this because she hit it. It was not her first time to apply. It is truly, with all sincerity, when the we get, you know, we start with a large pool of artists that have applied and, and curated in. And then there are, it comes down to four or five artists that propose and the selection panel selects from a proposal. And it literally is about bringing work that is going to touch the people who use this place. Glenda Lise expanded on that. And maybe she would like to, uh, they've, sorry, Glenda Lise, they would like to talk a little more about that process of getting to that point where you so, I hate to say it, you, you just nailed it. You really got it. And with all sincerity, I want every artist out there to know that that there's a team of people at Arts and Design, a team, not one person, not me, but a group of dedicated arts administrators that are trying to help artists every day capture that moment, capture that experience, capture what will what a group of people will determine this is right for that place. Glenda Lee, would you like to to maybe I know it'll be a little repetitive, but but address it again because I think it's very important for artists to know that the effort is there every day for this to be fair and accessible for everyone. Yeah, I thought that the process was fair. It also like I learned a lot during the process. The first time I applied, I realized, oh man, this is quite an effort. You know, you have to like have a lot of minds involved there's quite a bit of of you know since your practice is usually just you you have to think about a lot of people you have to think about the community you have to think about the architects you have to think about the mta you have to think about a lot of people and a lot of minds so you have to be in a lot of people's shoes when you're making it and mm -hmm. that takes a while because if you're just used to being in your shoes all the time it takes a while to incorporate other people's perspectives and then you have to be flexible okay in your practice because there's a lot of people that you're having to flex for and you know I just knew there was a moment of detachment I wasn't attached to it there's just like when I did this proposal I wasn't attached to the outcome I just like felt like this is it <laughs> it's like if they don't take this I don't know what to do anymore <laughs> you know it's kind of just felt you know when you like you just practice something so much and then you know you're gonna make that shot kind of like that mm -hmm. I don't know how else to explain it. The process was like anything. Everything that's worth getting is worth the effort, you know, so. It's, you're and describing I being in the zone, being in the zone where it's there. And, you know, I, I wish we could, I wish we could share how that happens, but I think it happens different for different artists in a different way, but in yeah. ultimately getting to a similar place that connects to a place. Yeah, and not trying to make the proposal any different than what you make in your own practice. That's the key there. That's the key. How do I make it public and private at the same time, like you were saying earlier? How do I make an intimate experience be public? Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, I think, Glendalee, yeah. you found the sweet spot. And I think we also found the sweet spot with this program. This was a really great group of people oh, I think, to discuss these, these two, yeah. three projects and a really great way to combine and kind of see a wide breadth of the system in just one program. So I'm gonna bring us home. Um, I'm gonna put a couple links in the chat to remind you how to come and visit the museum. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation or becoming a member to keep our programs going. And we also have more upcoming virtual events, which you can find on our website. 
The next one is actually going to be a talk by me on more art. If you like art, you should come to this one. It's going to be Keith Herring's Subway Drawings for National Coming Out Day. Uh, put the link in the chat. We also have lots of tickets to some of our other programs available that are off-site, not virtual programs. So we have a few walking tours this season and two upcoming vintage train rides. So you can check out our, our calendar page for more information. And so, yeah, I just wanna thank everyone again so much for all the time it took to go into this program. I thought it was really wonderful. And I'd also really love to thank our sponsor, Con Ed, for supporting our virtual programs. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.